Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Lisa Cecilia Hardham, the fiancé of a tyrant who turned a luxury apartment into a prison. Controlling behavior in couple relationships, unfortunately, is not uncommon and quite dangerous. It manifests itself when a person tries to subjugate and forcibly adapt their other half to their own needs through intimidation, demonstrations of strength and power, as well as humiliation and total control. Often the victim, because of the instilled feelings of fear and guilt, does not realize that he or she is in a destructive situation. The story of a young woman named Lisa Cecilia Hardham illustrates what a relationship with a control freak can lead to. She naively believed that she had met the love of her life, but she herself did not notice how her fiancé became a monster who turned their luxurious apartment into a real prison with 24-hour video surveillance. This case provoked an international scandal and was widely covered in the press. The unfortunate Lisa tried to make Lisa look mentally unstable and cold-blooded crime to pass off as an accident or voluntary resignation from life. However, the perpetrator, despite his money and connections, did not manage to escape responsibility. Now let's understand how her beloved man turned into a monster who hid his inhuman attitude behind care. Lisa Cecilia Hardham, Biography, Family, Early Years Our today's heroine was born in Canada on June 12, 1981, in the suburbs of Toronto, and was the second child in the family. Lisa was brought up together with her older brother Jason, with whom she has always been very close. They were raised independently by single mom, Joanna. Brother and sister did not remember their father because he left the family when the children were very young and no longer took any part in their lives. Lisa Cecilia grew up as an active and purposeful girl. From an early age, she was involved in sports. Together with her brother went to the martial arts section, liked to play soccer and volleyball. But her main passion has always been ballet. She daily visited the dance studio where she practiced at the bar for several hours. The girl from childhood was tall and slender, but professional ballet classes required the strictest diet, which had a detrimental effect on the growing body. In adolescence, Lisa developed anorexia on the background of eating disorders. For a long time, she kept silent about her problem, believing that she could cope with everything herself. But when her weight approached critically low values, her mother sounded the alarm and put her daughter in the clinic, where Lisa needed to spend several months to restore health and weight gain. After graduating from school, the girl continued dancing classes and also decided to connect her life with the beauty industry. In parallel with her university studies, she got a job as a perfumer in one of the stores of a large cosmetics chain, and in her spare time, she studied the subtleties of makeup and hairdressing, moving to Australia. In 2005, having celebrated her 24th birthday, Lisa decided to make drastic changes in her life. She wanted to go to the other side of the world, to Australia, and there were several reasons for that. Firstly, she wanted to live in a warmer and milder climate. And secondly, Lisa wanted to see the world. She took a one-year work visa and traveled to another continent. However, with her then flew Joanna, who accompanied her daughter for the first few months, to make sure that she was all right, and she settled well in the new place. The mother then returned back to Toronto with peace of mind, making sure her daughter could take care of herself. Lisa settled in Sydney, where she rented a cozy apartment and soon got a job at a local small cosmetology company. After her visa expired, she decided to move to Australia permanently. First, she extended her stay for another year and then began to prepare the necessary documents to obtain citizenship of this country. Personal life. As for personal life, in this respect, everything was not easy. The fact is that Lisa always preferred to meet with older men. Obviously, not the least role in this played a lack of a father in the family, so she always reached out to more mature men, looking for support and protection in them. In 2006, Lisa successfully interviewed for a job at Sydney Cosmetics and was hired. She soon began a romantic relationship with a co-worker who was almost twice her age. A few months later, they decided to start living together, and Lisa moved into the apartment of her lover. And after a couple more months, the girl introduced her boyfriend to her mom and brother, and they approved her choice. 
The couple traveled a lot around the world, rested in the Seychelles in Paris, and also visited the famous carnival in Rio de Janeiro. The man even made Lisa a marriage proposal, which she gladly accepted. But about a year after the engagement, the lovers broke up. Lisa did not go into detail about the reasons for this decision, but hinted that too great a difference in age, however, played in this not the least role. In 2010, Lisa graduated from the Sydney College of Stylists and got a job as a hairdresser in a popular beauty salon, where she quickly won the respect of colleagues and the trust of customers. At the same time, a new boyfriend appeared in her life, but their romance did not last long because Lisa found out that he was married. Destroy someone else's family she was not going to, so she quickly broke off the relationship. But shortly before that, at one of the parties, this guy introduced her friend, a businessman named Simon Gitney. This acquaintance turned out to be fatal for Lisa. Who is Simon Gitney? Simon was born in Maryland in December 1973 in a very religious, large family of immigrants from Lebanon. He had five other siblings, whom his parents raised in strictness and obedience. However, Simon from a young age had problems with controlling emotions and outbursts of anger, and he was also possessive, did not tolerate rejection, and often gave the will of his fists. All this eventually led to serious problems with the law. The first time Gitney was behind bars was at the age of 18, when he came to his ex-girlfriend in the store where she worked and began to openly molest her. The store owner interceded for the girl and threw the impudent man out the door, but Simon returned with friends who grabbed the store owner and held him while Simon beat him severely. That time, the guy only served a few months and was released on bail for good behavior afterwards. But three years later, he was arrested again, this time on theft charges. However, Simon resisted violently, threw himself into a fight, and bit off one of the policemen's earlobe. He was threatened with a serious prison sentence for this prank, but the pastor of the Lebanese Christian Church, of which his entire family was members, interceded. As a result, the young man spent only a year and a half in prison. In 2000, Simon again came to the attention of the police, and this time he was arrested for possession and distribution of illegal substances. But the sentence was again extremely lenient, and he served two years out of the four assigned to him. On release, Gitani, as it seemed to everyone, took the path of correction. He moved to Sydney, where with a few friends founded a fairly successful business for the production and sale of luxury women's shoes. This business brought a stable high income, so Simon quickly became rich, acquired luxury real estate in a prestigious neighborhood, a premium class car, and carefully tried to hide from everyone his rich criminal past. From his roommates to his lovers, at that party, Simon and Lisa exchanged phone numbers, and soon he called her himself. Their relaxed communication somehow imperceptibly grew into a buddy relationship. And when in January 2010, Lisa complained that she was unhappy with her current living conditions and would like to rent an apartment in another neighborhood, Gitani kindly offered her to live for free in one of the rooms of his luxurious apartment while she was looking for a suitable place to rent. Lisa accepted the offer although her mother was somewhat alarmed by this turn of events. But Lisa convinced Joanna that it was a temporary measure and that she and Simon are just friends. By the way, she herself at that time thought that the man who so carefully monitors his appearance and adores piercings prefer to build relationships with guys. But this opinion turned out to be wrong. For the first couple of months, Gitani really kept his distance. The young people lived in separate rooms and there was not even a hint of intimacy or romance between them. But gradually they got closer, the so-called spark, and started a romance which quickly gained momentum. At the time of the beginning of their relationship, Simon was 37 years old and Lisa, 28. Simon seemed to her a beautiful prince from a fairy tale. He was sociable, cheerful, spoiled his beloved with gifts, and arranged her pleasant surprises. The couple began to appear everywhere together, in particular, they went together to an elite sports club, which Simon attended regularly for many years. Lisa was sure that finally met her true love and will live a long, happy life with the chosen one. She raved about him to her mother, brother, and friends, and had no idea that this fairy tale would soon end. An affectionate tyrant. 
Just six months after the beginning of the relationship, Simon's behavior began to change, but it happened in stages and in such a way that Lisa did not notice anything, thinking that the lover does everything for her own good. He gradually distanced Lisa from friends and family, erased all her personal boundaries, tried to change her views, tastes, and behavior, adjusting them to his needs. In June 2010, shortly after Lisa celebrated her 29th birthday, Simon began to persistently persuade her to quit her job, claiming that she was not valued there and she could find a better paid position. But Lisa loved working at the beauty salon, where she had many regular clients and was happy with her income, so she didn't understand why she should quit her job and refuse to do so. Simon was not satisfied with the refusal, and in August of the same year, he showed up at Lisa's salon, having thrown a loud scandal, which actually forced her to write a letter of resignation. Lisa Hardham was shocked by his behavior, but Gitani assured that it would be better, and in general, she can no longer work, because his income will allow them both to live comfortably, nothing to deny themselves. A month and a half later, the couple moved into a new luxury apartment, located on the 15th floor of an elite residential complex. As it later turned out, the room was literally stuffed with hidden surveillance cameras, of which Lisa, of course, did not even guess. Simon gave his beloved an expensive smartphone and laptop, pre-installed on them spyware that allowed him to track all her messages, emails, as well as listen to calls and see all of Lisa's movements. In addition, Simon gained access to her social media accounts and began to discreetly clean lists of friends, delete posts and photos at his discretion, as well as read personal correspondence. Total control. Gitani's control over Lisa increased day by day, but as an experienced manipulator, he made it look as if his girlfriend wanted to do as he told her. Gitani had invaded literally every aspect of her life, leaving no hint of privacy. He forbade Lisa to use cosmetics, claiming that she does too bright makeup, which makes her look vulgar. He also bought her closed and unsightly clothes in gray and black colors, and all her outfits simply threw away, arguing that they were too revealing, and men would stare at her. From the apartment Lisa went out only accompanied by her lover, they visited together only those places that he himself chose. Simon even forbade her to visit the gym. Instead, he bought several expensive exercise machines, saying that now she could train at home. Lisa's social media friend lists were dwindling by the day, and eventually Gitani convinced her to delete the accounts. Lisa also had no friends left in real life, and all her contacts and calls were closely monitored. Simon only allowed her to communicate with her mother and brother. Last trip home. In December 2010, Lisa decided to fly to Canada to celebrate Christmas with her family. Simon was going to fly with her, but at the last moment his plans were disrupted because of urgent business matters. He didn't plan to let his friend go alone, but she literally begged him, because she hadn't seen her mom and brother for over a year. In the end, he agreed but set strict conditions and rules, which she had to strictly follow. Jason and Joanna were shocked at the changes that had happened to Lisa over the past year. She was nothing like the bright and cheerful beauty she had been before. She had literally become her own shadow. There was not a drop of makeup on her face. Her luxurious hair was pulled into a ponytail and hidden under a headdress. Her clothes were baggy, unattractive, and completely black. But it wasn't even the outward changes that were the most frightening. Lisa flinched every time the phone rang and instantly grabbed the receiver. It was one of Simon's conditions. She had to answer immediately, at any time of day, no matter what she was doing at that moment. Lisa stayed at her mother's house all the time, refused to see her friends, and hardly ever went out. Joanna was alarmed and frightened by this behavior of her daughter, and she decided to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her. Then Lisa burst into tears and admitted that Simon always knows where she is, with whom she communicates, and what she talks about on the phone. Lisa also revealed that Simon doesn't allow her to work, see her friends, go to the gym, or have any hobbies. In fact, she had no friends left at all. Her mother was shocked. She began to persuade her daughter to stay in Canada, because in Australia she has nothing to keep her. But Lisa said that she loved Simon, and did not want to break off the relationship with him. Lisa was sure that this is just a transitional period in their relationship because they have been together for less than a year and soon he will calm down and loosen his grip. 
She also added that her lover cares about her and wishes her only good. Despite pleas from her family to stay and attempts to convince Lisa that the relationship was unhealthy, she decided to move back to Australia to stay with Gitney. Lisa reassured her mother, saying that there was nothing to worry about and that Simon loved her and would not hurt her. Prisoner After Lisa returned, the situation only got worse. Simon forbade her to leave the apartment, and if they went out together, she had to look only at her feet so as not to meet the eyes of other men. Moreover, Simon began to call Lisa by her second name, Cecilia, because it seemed more decent to him. In the spring of 2011, Lisa began to complain of pain in her leg. It was an old injury received in his youth during ballet classes. But instead of taking her to the hospital, Gitani hired a female physical therapist who came to their home three times a week to give her massages. She soon became Lisa's only friend and confidant, to whom Lisa spoke candidly about the difficult situation she found herself in. On June 12th, for Lisa's 30th birthday, Simon decided to throw a party at the most expensive restaurant in Sydney, but among the guests were only Simon's relatives and people from his inner circle. Lisa, on her own birthday, boyfriend did not allow to invite anyone. At the end of the evening, Simon proposed to Lisa by putting a ring on her finger. Hardham responded with consent and then cried, but all present noticed that these were not tears of joy, but rather tears of despair and hopelessness. Back home, Lisa called her mother and informed her of her engagement, sobbing into the phone. But Joanna was not at all happy about it. She began to persuade her daughter to leave this man and, as soon as possible, to return home to Canada. In response, Lisa only asked her mother never to start such conversations on the phone. At that moment, she already realized that the fiancé was listening to the calls, although she did not know for sure. Escape Plan For a while, Lisa tried to distract herself with thoughts of the upcoming wedding and began planning the festivities. When she decided to consult with Simon about something related to the event, he rudely cut her off and told her that he would choose the place, buy her a dress, and make the guest list. Lisa was utterly crushed, for she had no say even here. During another visit to the physiotherapist, Lisa admitted that she couldn't go on like this, but she couldn't leave because her fiancé wouldn't let her go. Together, they developed a plan according to which Lisa, at each visit of the masseuse, gave her some of her belongings for safekeeping, but did everything so that Simon did not notice anything. On July 28th, Simon left his laptop at home in a hurry, which he usually carried with him everywhere. Lisa took advantage of this and looked into it, and her worst fears were realized. There she found a spyware program, with the help of which the fiancé received all the data from her phone, as well as numerous recordings of her conversations with her mother. But the most horrifying discovery was the surveillance footage from the security cameras located in every room of their apartment. That same day, Lisa, using her physical therapist's phone, called her mother and asked her to come on the next flight to her apartment and take her home. However, Joanna could not leave work so quickly. She needed time to ask for an excuse to switch shifts with one of her colleagues. Afterwards, the woman could never forgive herself for this delay. Back home, Simon immediately realized that his fiance had taken his laptop and seen the spyware. Lisa cried, trying to figure out why she deserved to be treated that way, but Simon only pointed out that he'd done it for her own good. Accident or murder? The next day, July 29th, a serious conversation took place between the young people, the recording of which was later presented in court. Lisa was in tears and asked to go home, but Gitani calmly and confidently said that this would never happen, asked Lisa to calm down, and claimed that she had mental problems. On the morning of July 30th, 2011, Lisa got up early, got fully dressed, and put her documents and essentials in her purse. She locked herself in the bathroom and called her mother one last time, telling her that if anything happened to her, it would be Simon's fault. Apparently, Lisa wanted to leave the apartment unnoticed while her fiancé slept, but she failed. What happened next can only be guessed. According to neighbors, they heard a scream in the hallway, but did not have time to react because all abruptly hushed. And exactly a minute later, a young woman fell from the balcony of the 15th floor, crashing to her death. 
Several passers-by on the street also heard the scream and saw a body falling from a height, but did not have time to realize what was happening. According to a guy who was walking his dog that morning and was closest to the scene, he heard a noise and looked up. The eyewitness saw a man holding something large, which he then threw down. When passers-by came to the place of the fall, they saw a young woman lying on the ground, but all attempts to help her were in vain, as she died instantly, having received extensive injuries. Three minutes later, Gitani, dressed in his pajamas, ran out into the street. He was crying, saying he didn't know how he was going to live his life, and claiming that he hadn't caught his fiancé in time. At first glance, it looked like an accident, but Simon himself was quick to claim that his fiancé had voluntarily passed away. A note in his pocket and a frightening video. Strange things began as soon as the body was taken to the morgue and examined. In different pockets were found fragments of a note torn into small pieces with the text. There are cameras everywhere in the apartment. Probably Lisa was afraid that Simon might find the message, so she turned the note into a kind of garbage and scattered it in different pockets. A check showed that there were indeed a lot of cameras in the apartment, but the hard disk with recordings could not be found, and Simon claimed that there was no video recording at all. A surveillance camera in the communal hallway, on the other hand, captured something frightening. The short clip shows Lisa running out of the apartment and calling for help, but her fiancé grabs her from behind, covers her mouth, and drags her back in. This happened a minute before she fell off the balcony, and it was this scream that the neighbors heard. And Gitani's laptop was found to contain a recording of a conversation he and Lisa had the night before the tragedy, as well as spyware that Simon used to spy on his fiancé. According to Simon, he and Lisa had an argument that morning, and she became hysterical. She ran out into the hallway screaming, but he brought her back because he didn't want to put on a show for the neighbors. In the apartment, he picked up the phone to call her mother, but Lisa ran out to the balcony at that moment and threw herself down, and he ran after her but did not catch her in time. He claimed that she had threatened to take her own life before, but he didn't take her word seriously. But Gitani attributed the spy program to his concern for his fiancé's safety. Trial and Sentencing In the course of the trial, Simon was accompanied by already a new pasta, 22-year-old model Rachel Louise, who was just incredibly similar to his dead fiancé. However, later it was said that the girl just wanted to become famous at the expense of this high-profile case, and therefore willingly talked to the press and appeared on television, saying that Gitani would never raise his hand on a woman. Simon's lawyers tried to convince the court that Lisa suffered from a mental disorder, was prone to hysterics, and could have voluntarily passed away. Even a long history of anorexia and treatment in a clinic came up, the defense also argued that the defendant, being short in stature, simply could not physically lift Lisa, who was taller than him, and also could not throw her off the balcony. But this version was refuted by a trainer from the gym, which Simon had attended regularly for many years. According to the trainer, the defendant worked with heavy weights, was much stronger than he appeared outwardly, and could easily have lifted Lisa. This was also supported by the absence of Lisa's fingerprints on the railing and the glass barrier, as she could not have jumped without leaning on them. Also testifying in court was the physiotherapist to whom Lisa had told in detail everything that had happened to her and had given her her belongings in the hope of escaping from the tyrant. It was her testimony that was decisive. Gitani was found guilty of murdering his fiancé and sentenced to 26 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 18 years. After the verdict was announced, Rachel Louise threw a tantrum and began to insult the judge, for which she was removed from the room. All attempts by Simon and his lawyers to challenge the court's decision were rejected, and the verdict remained in force. Rachel soon dumped her boyfriend, saying in an interview that it was difficult for them to maintain a relationship in prison, but she remains convinced of his innocence. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click the bell not to miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.